Today we'll talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. We'll talk about the definition, the burden of COPD, risk factors, pathology, diagnosis, and treatment. The definition of COPD is that it is a common, preventable, and treatable disease. It is true it is preventable because more than 90% of COPD cases are related to smoking. It is treatable, but it is not curable. It's not like asthma. Those patients, whatever treatment you give them, if they develop COPD, you will not regain normal pulmonary function. And this disease is characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation. While in asthma, the symptoms vary in time and severity, and there is a reversible airflow limitation here. It is persistent. And this is due either to airway or alveolar abnormalities, and usually these are caused by significant exposure to noxious gases or particles. And practically speaking, more than 90% of COPD is related to smoking. The most common respiratory symptoms in these patients are dyspnea, cough, with or without sputum. And these symptoms are underreported by the Patients. These patients usually they are middle aged, they have cough and little sputum, and they attribute this to smoking. They might have shortness of breath and they attribute it to being getting old and because they are smokers. About 50% of COPD cases all around the world they are not diagnosed or under diagnosed. The main risk factor for COPD is tobacco smoking, but other exposures like environmental exposure, such as biomass fuel exposure and air pollution, may contribute to the development of COPD. Besides exposure, host factors predispose individuals to COPD. These include genetic factors, abnormal lung development, and accelerated age. We'll come to that in a minute. COPD patients may have periods of acute worsening of respiratory symptoms, we call these exacerbations. In most patients with COPD, they have associated significant concomitant chronic diseases, which increase its mortality and morbidity. And we'll talk about these comorbidities that are seen in COPD. Here, if you look at this graph, about 50% of COPD patients, they develop COPD because of accelerated decline in pulmonary function. The red line here, they attain normal pulmonary function when they are about 20 years. Usually these are smokers and they have rapid decline in FEV1 that lead to COPD. The other 50%, they don't attain these patients normal lung function at the age of 20 or 25. This is probably either related to prematurity or severe respiratory infections in early childhood. Although they don't have accelerated decline in pulmonary function, this is the black line, about 6.1% develop COPD. But if these patients who have uh, did not attain normal pulmonary function when they are adults and if they are smokers, they are more likely to develop COPD. The prevalence of COPD, it is estimated about 384 million cases in 2010. The estimated global prevalence is about 11.7%. There are about 3 million deaths annually, so it causes significant number of mortality. And by 2030 predicted mortality about 4.5 million deaths and so COPD is probably the third leading cause of death worldwide. With the increasing prevalence of smoking in developing countries and aging population in high income countries, the prevalence of COPD is expected to rise over the next 30 years. 
What's about prevalence of smoking in Jordan? Jordan now is probably the leading country all around the world in the prevalence of smoking. In 2011, about 42% of people aged 15 and above, they smoked tobacco. Males about 55.9% and females 23.7%. About 35% smoked cigarettes, another 15 smoked water pipe, and 2% other types of tobacco. A government study in collaboration with the WHO in 2019, it showed that more than 8 out of 10 Jordanian men use nicotine products regularly, including electronic cigarettes. Jordanian men who smoke regularly consume on average about 23 cigarettes per day. Even excluding electronic cigarettes and other smokeless products, the study found that 66% of men and 17% of women were smoking. And unfortunately, even among physicians, they have similar rates of smoking. What's the economic burden and social burden of COPD? COPD is associated with significant economic burden. Exacerbations account for the greatest proportion of the total COPD burden. For example, in the European Union, direct cost of respiratory diseases, about 6% of the total healthcare budget. COPD accounting for about 56% of the cost of respiratory diseases, costing about 38.6 billion euros. In the United States, direct cost of COPD around 32 billion and indirect cost another 20 billion dollars. What factors that influence the disease progression? There are genetic factors. The only one which is well characterized is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This is autosomal recessive, and other genes that encode for matrix metalloproteinases and glutathione S-transferase, they also contribute to COPD. Age and gender, with aging, the prevalence of COPD is higher, but the gender is probably not that much effect. If a male or female, they smoke to the same degree, they are more likely to have similar incidence of COPD. The lung growth and development is important, as I mentioned previously. About 50% of COPD cases are due to failure to attain normal lung function at early adulthood, due either to prematurity or severe respiratory infection during early childhood. Exposure to particles, occupational exposures, and outdoor air pollution, socioeconomic status, Smokers who are from the low socioeconomic status, they are more likely to develop COPD than higher socioeconomic status. This could be related to the type of food they are taking. Higher social status take fresh fruits and vegetables, and these are containing antioxidants. But there is no safe smoking. Whatever you eat, if you are a smoker, you are at risk of developing COPD or other smoke-related diseases. Those who have asthma and airway hyperresponsiveness or hyperreactivity, they are more prone to develop COPD than others, especially if they are smokers. Those who have chronic bronchitis, which means cough and sputum production for most of the days for three months for two consecutive years, they are more likely to develop COPD later. Infections in childhood also, they are risk factors for developing COPD later in life. What's about the pathology, pathogenesis, and pathophysiology? Pathology, there is a chronic inflammation, especially in the conducting airways, and there are structural changes. Those who have emphysema, there is permanent dilatation and destruction of the gas exchange units. These 
chronic inflammation in the airways and the emphysematous changes are related to oxidative stresses from the chemicals in smoking. There's an imbalance between protease and antiproteases. There are inflammatory cells, and usually these are neutrophils rather than eosinophils. And there are inflammatory mediators, and there is structural changes. There is peribronchular and interstitial fibrosis. Due to the airflow limitation, we have gas trapping, and that contributes to the shortness of breath these patients has. And if there is abnormalities or emphysematous changes, then the gas exchange is impaired and there is hypoxemia. And with the chronic bronchitis, there is mucus hypersecretion with the mucus plugs obstructing the airways. All these will lead to hypoxia. Hypoxia will lead to pulmonary hypertension due to hypoxia-induced vasoconstriction. Here we can see the difference between the inflammation in asthma and COPD. The inflammatory cells in asthma are usually eosinophils, mast cells, CD4 T cells, and few macrophages, while in COPD, predominantly neutrophilic, and they are CD, there are CD8 T cells, and the macrophages are prominent. The mediators in asthma are the leukotriene D4, histamine, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and reactive oxygen species, very little. While in COPD, leukotriene D4, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, and excess of reactive oxygen species. Asthma affect all the airways, while in COPD, predominantly affect the peripheral airways and can lead to lung destruction if there is emphysema with fibrosis in the lung or very bronchially, and there is squamous metaplasia. The response to steroids, inhaled corticosteroids, is excellent in asthmatic patients, while in COPD, usually they don't respond to inhaled corticosteroids. The slide shows the difference between asthma and COPD pathology. On the left-hand side, the patient who died from asthma, you can see that there is inflammation, but the inflammatory cells are different. In asthma, usually they are eosinophils, mast cells, while in COPD, predominantly neutrophilic. Airway smooth muscle hypertrophy is more prominent in asthma than in COPD. Basement membrane thickening is more prominent in asthma than COPD, but the peribronchial fibrosis is more prominent in COPD than asthma, little fibrosis. There is no alveolar disruption in asthma, while in COPD, usually there is emphysematous changes with alveolar disruption. What's about diagnosis and initial assessment? The common symptoms of COPD are chronic and progressive shortness of breath. They have cough, they might have sputum production, wheezing, and chest tightness. Other symptoms include fatigue, weight loss, anorexia, syncope from severe cough, even rib fractures they might have if they have severe cough. They might have ankle edema, depression, or anxiety. If we, any patient who came with symptoms suggestive of COPD, that's cough, shortness of breath, and wheeze, and he's a smoker, we have to suspect COPD. And we have to confirm the presence of COPD and assess the severity of airflow limitation. So if we suspect that the patient has COPD, we have to do spirometry. This is normal spirometry. The first column, the predicted values. This depends on the age, gender, and height of the person. This is pre-treatment before giving bronchodilator and the post-treatment after giving bronchodilator. This is spirometry of a patient who has COPD. The hallmark of COPD is that the FEV1 over FVC ratio in the post-bronchodilator test has to be less than 70%. Here it is 59. And as we said that this is not reversible disease. 
So we looked at the FEV1 before and after bronchodilator. Before bronchodilator it was 2.24 and after bronchodilator 2.2. And it is 86%. So this is COPD and this is a mild disease because the severity of the disease is determined by how much the FEV1 as percent of predicted. The second spirometry is for a patient who has very severe disease. The FEV1 over FBC ratio in the post treatment is 25, and his FEV1 is 26% of predicted. So this is below 30, so this is very severe. If we do total lung capacity in these patients, we'll find that it is increased. It's about 150% of predicted. And majority of this is residual volume. So you see the residual volume is about 5.47 liter, which is 233% of the predicted. The diffusion capacity is about 82%. So this is normal. So this is very severe COPD and predominantly due to chronic bronchitis. Because if this is emphysema, the diffusion should be reduced. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a risk factor for developing COPD. These patients who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, if they are smokers, they develop COPD at early age, even in their 30s. If they are non-smokers, they develop COPD in their 40s. And usually this is predominantly emphysema, and it causes panlobular emphysema, affecting the lower lobes more than the upper lobes while the smoke-related emphysema affects the upper lobes, and it is sentry lobular or sentry SNR. The World Health Organization recommends that all patients with COPD should be screened once for alpha-1 antitrypsin in areas with high prevalence, and this is more common in Caucasians. A concentration of alpha-1 antitrypsin less than 20% of the normal is highly suggestive of homozygous deficiency. The severity of COPD is assessed by spirometry. All COPD patients, they have FEV1 over FBC ratio less than 0.7 or 70%, and the severity according to the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease depend on the FEV1 how much percent of predicted. Mild disease when the FEV1 more than 80%, Moderate when the FEV1 between 50 and 80 percent of predicted, severe disease when the FEV1 between 30 and 50 percent, and very severe if the FEV1 less than 30 percent of predicted. The second thing we have to determine how much the disease affects the patient health status, and we do that. We have different scale to assess how much the disease affects the patient life. The most commonly used is the Modified Medical Research Council scale. This has grades from 0 to 5. 0, it means that the patient gets shortness of breath only with strenuous exercise. Grade 1, when he got short of breath while hurrying on level or walking up hill. Grade 2, he walks slower than people of the same age on level because of breathlessness, or he has to stop if he is walking alone after walking some distance. Grade four, when he is too breathless even to leave the house or when dressing or undressing. The other tool which we use is the COPD assessment test to see how much the disease affects the patient's life. And this a bit complicated, more than the Medical Research Council scale. It looks into eight parameters about the cough, sputum production, short of breath, how energetic the patient feels uh, about his sleep and about activities. So these are grades from zero to five. And we measure these and we get the total score. The other important thing to consider in managing patients with COPD is to assess the exacerbation risk. 
What we mean by exacerbation, these are acute worsening of respiratory symptoms that result in additional therapy. And the exacerbations might be classified as mild when they require only short-acting beta bronchodilators, moderate when they are treated with short-acting beta uh, bronchodilators plus antibiotics and or oral steroids, severe when the patient requires hospitalization or visit to the emergency room. Severe exacerbation may also be associated with respiratory failure. Blood eosinophil count may also predict exacerbation rate in patients treated with LABA without inhaled corticosteroids. So in a patient who has COPD, we have to look into three parameters. How severe the COPD from the pulmonary function test, how the disease affects the patient health, either the medical research council dyspnea scale or the CAT score. And the other thing is the patient prone to get exacerbation, the exacerbation from history. We ask the patient during the past year whether he had any exacerbations or not. So we have four categories of patients with COPD. Group A, these patients, they have COPD, but they have minimal symptoms and they are not exacerbation prone. Group B, they are symptomatic more than group A, but they are not exacerbation prone. Group C, they have minimal symptoms, but they are exacerbation prone. Group B, they are very symptomatic and they are exacerbation prone. Once COPD is diagnosed, effective management should be based on an individualized assessment to reduce both current symptoms and reduce future risk of exacerbation. How to reduce symptoms? We have to relieve the symptoms of the patients, improve exercise tolerance, and improve health status. These are the goals of treatment. And we have to prevent disease progression and prevent and treat exacerbation and reduce mortality. The only thing that can prevent the disease progression is stopping the smoking, or if the COPD is related to other factors like coal mining, is to or occupational things then to change the occupation of the patient. All other treatments, they can improve the symptoms, but they will not stop the progression of the. So we have to identify and reduce exposure to known risk factors. Identification and reduction of exposure to risk factor is important in the treatment of COPD. Cigarette smoking is the most commonly encountered and easily identifiable risk factor. And smoking cessation should be encouraged for all individuals. Reduction of total personal exposure to occupational dust, fumes, gases, and indoor outdoor air pollution also should be addressed. As we said, smoking cessation is the most important step in stopping the progression of disease, the COPD. We have to adopt this five A's. We have to ask any patient who came to our clinic, even if he is, his disease is not related to smoking, we have to ask the patient whether he is a smoker or not. We have to advise him to quit smoking even if his disease is not related to smoking. We have to assess his ability to quit smoking. And if he said that he tried and failed, we have to help him, assist him by prescribing nicotine replacement patches or nicotine receptor agonist or certain antidepressants. And we have to arrange for another visit. Nowadays in Jordan, we have smoking cessation clinics. We refer these patients to these clinics to help them with smoking. This slide showed the effect of smoking cessation on pulmonary function on FEV1. The first panel in light red, those who permanently quit smoking in the first year, their pulmonary function improve a little. 
second year might be stable and then slowly going down. While those who continue to smoke, those in green line, there is rapid deterioration in pulmonary function. Those who intermittently quit and goes back to smoking, they have some benefit, but not as good as those who have quitted smoking forever. All COPD patients should have annual uh, influenza vaccine, and those who are above age 65 should have a 13 valent pneumococcal conjugated vaccine, and after one year to receive the 23 valent pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. What drugs we have to improve the symptoms of patients with COPD? We have different categories of drugs. We have the beta-2 agonists, whether short-acting or long-acting, anticholinergics or antimascarinics, whether short-acting or long-acting, and anticholinergics, methyls and thines, or combinations of long-acting beta-2 agonists and inhaled corticosteroids, or even triple combinations with long-acting beta-2 agonists, long-acting antimascarinics, and inhaled corticosteroids. Phosphodiesterase for inhibitors, roflomilast, and mucolytic agents like N-acetylcysteine, carbocysteine, or herbicine. We will come to that in a minute. What are the indications for these different groups of Most of the medications for COPD are given by inhalation route. We have to explain to the patient how to use these devices, and we try to choose the device that the patient can use properly. So teaching and educating the patient about how to use the inhaler is important and advise him to be compliant with the medication. So back to this diagram. After diagnosing COPD, we assess the severity by the pulmonary function and we see the risk of exacerbation and how much the disease affects the patient. And we have four groups of patients, A, B, C, and D. For those in group A, for example, they have COPD, but they have minimal symptoms and they are not at risk of developing exacerbation. So these patients usually are treated by a bronchodilator, whether a long-acting beta-2 agonist or long-acting antimascarinic. These are preferable than using the short-acting beta-2 agonist. Group B, they have COPD, they have significant symptoms, but they have low exacerbation risk. Usually, we start with long-acting antimascarinic or long-acting beta-2 agonist. If we start with one, we review the patient after a few months. If he is still symptomatic, we can combine these together. In group C, they have COPD, whatever the severity is, but they have minimal symptoms, but they are exacerbation prone. Usually, we start with long-acting antimascarinics. If further exacerbations happen, we add long-acting beta-2 agonists. If still there are exacerbations, we add inhaled corticosteroids. This slide showed which factors we consider in initiating inhaled corticosteroids. There is strong support for those who have history of hospitalization for exacerbation, one or more of COPD. This is an indication to give inhaled corticosteroids. Or if he has more than or equal to two moderate exacerbation per year, or if there is blood eosinophilia, or history of, or there is concomitant asthma. We can consider the use of inhaled corticosteroids in COPD if there is one moderate exacerbation of COPD per year, and if the eosinophil count in the blood between 100 to 300 cells. Against use, those who have repeated pneumonia, and if the blood is in a field less than 100 cells per cubic microliter, or history of mycobacterial infection. So, 
in health corticosteroids they have limited use because there is risk of increase or increased risk of developing pneumonia in those patients with COPD who are taking inhaled corticosteroids. Group D patients, they have significant symptoms and high risk of exacerbation. Usually we start with long-acting antimascarinic and long-acting beta-2 agonist. If there are still exacerbation, we add inhaled corticosteroids. If they are still having exacerbation, we can add either proflomilast, which is a post with a stereo 4 inhibitor, if their FEV1 is less than 50% of predicted, and patients has chronic bronchitis rather than emphysema. Also, we can consider macrolides. They have anti-inflammatory. We use them for their anti-inflammatory effect rather than for antibacterial effect. And these we have to monitor them for side effects, especially deafness in these elderly people. The role of mucolytics, there is a Cochrane review in 2019 about mucolytics, appear to be useful for reducing flare-ups, which are the exacerbations, days of disability, and hospital admissions in patients with chronic bronchitis or COPD, and do not appear to cause more side effects. However, they don't appear to have much impact on quality of life, lung function, and the authors could not be sure about their impact on life or mortality. So the mucolytics, patients can take them. They are having a safe side effect profile, but probably the benefit is not that much. Do we have other interventional therapy in patients with stable COPD? We have what we call the lung volume reduction surgery. This is a surgical procedure in those who have severe disease, if they have emphysema affecting the upper lobes predominantly. It doesn't help patients if they don't have emphysema. We have other also interventions like bolectomy or transplantation or bronchoscopic interventions. What we do in lung volume reduction surgery, we remove the upper lobes. If the upper lobes are predominantly affected by emphysema, then we remove them. That will give a space for the relatively normal lung tissue to fill the thoracic cavity, and the diaphragms, instead of being flat, will regain their dome shape. But if the emphysema is diffused, it doesn't help this surgery. Or if the patient doesn't have emphysema, there is no place for this. This patient has a large bolus, which affects the relatively normal lung tissue, so we can remove that bolus that can help the patients. What's about non-pharmacological treatment? We have to educate the patient about self-management. We have to encourage physical activity. We have to introduce or uh, engage these patients in pulmonary rehabilitation programs, exercise training, and we have to discuss end-of-life and palliative care. Some patients choose not to be put on endotracheal tube when they have exacerbations. We have to support these patients' nutrition and advice on vaccination and oxygen therapy if they develop chronic respiratory. About the palliative end-of-life and hospice care, in many patients, COPD is marked by gradual decline in health status and increasing symptoms. And they might have exacerbations every now and then with an increased risk of dying. Although the mortality rates following hospitalization for an acute exacerbation are declining, the reported rate is still very high from 23 to 80%. So those who have severe exacerbation, they have a chance of dying between 23 to 80% according to the presence of other comorbidities.
the non-pharmacologic treatment include oxygen therapy. If the patient develops chronic respiratory failure, which means that their PO2 is less than 55 millimeter mercury, or if the PO2 between 55 and 60, plus evidence of either core pulmonale or erythrocytosis, the PCV or tax cell volume more than 55%, this is an indication for long-term oxygen therapy. The core pulmonale is defined by right-sided hypertrophy with or without failure secondary to pulmonary disease. And this can be diagnosed by doing echocardiogram. If the patient is a candidate for oxygen, we supply them with oxygen therapy to use at home, and we have to review them in two to three months and to decide whether the oxygen is still needed and if prescribed supplemental oxygen is effective. This slide shows the effect of oxygen therapy on survival. The longer the patient uses the oxygen therapy, the better is the survival benefit. Those in red line, those who use the oxygen for almost 24 hours. Those in black who use it for 15 hours, and those in yellow, those who use it for 12 hours. So oxygen therapy has to be used at least 15 hours a day to have a survival benefit. How we monitor these patients and follow them up? We have to measure any decline in FEV1, and at least we have to do spirometry once every year. In each visit, we assess the patient symptoms and also whether they have cough, short of breath, or sputum production, any limitation of activity. And we have to discuss with the patient also if he has any exacerbations, so we might modify the treatment of if they have still have exacerbation, adding another drug. Imaging, if there is clear worsening of the symptoms, imaging may be indicated. And nowadays, all and yeah, most of the COPD are due to smoking. And if the patient is above 55 years, and he smoked more than 30 pack years, we have to do low dose annual CT chest to look for early detection of lung cancer. And in each visit, we assess the smoking status of the patient and encourage him and help him to quit smoking. Also, in each visit of the patient to the clinic, we have to assess the dosage of prescribed medication. We have to discuss with the patient whether he is compliant with the medications. We check his inhalation technique and effectiveness of the current regimen, whether it relieves the symptoms or not, and look for side effects of these drugs. Treatment modifications should be recommended if it is required. What's about the management of COPD exacerbation? An exacerbation of COPD is defined as an acute worsening of respiratory symptoms that result in additional therapy. The exacerbation can be precipitated by several factors, but commonly precipitated by viral respiratory infections or other respiratory infections. Even air pollution also can contribute to the uh, COPD exacerbation. They are classified into mild, moderate, and severe. Mild when they are treated with short-acting beta-2 agonist or bronchodilators only. Moderate when they are treated with short-acting bronchodilators plus antibiotic and or oral steroids. Severe if they require hospital admission or emergency room visit. The goal of treating COPD exacerbation is to minimize the negative impact of the current exacerbation and prevent future or subsequent events. Usually, these patients require short-acting beta-2 agonist either alone or in combination with anticholinergic drugs. Systemic corticosteroids can improve lung function and oxygenation and shorten recovery. Usually, we give it for short period, five to seven days. 
antibiotics when indicated has to be given and should not be given more than five to seven days. Common organisms involved in exacerbations are the pneumococci, Haemophilus influenza, Moraxilla cataralis. So a second generation Cavarosporin or advanced generation macrolide like azithromycin are enough. But if the patient has severe exacerbation that requires admission to the ICU, we have to give higher coverage of antibiotics. Methyls and thines like theophylline are not recommended due to the increased side effects. They are not recommended to treat exacerbations. Oxygen therapy is to correct the hypoxia, preferably via Venturi mask. If the patient deteriorated or has type 2 respiratory failure with the exacerbation, non-invasive mechanical ventilation should be the first mode of ventilation with acute respiratory failure. But if the patient cannot tolerate the non-invasive ventilation, we might go for intubation and invasive mechanical. The respiratory support indications for invasive mechanical ventilation, if the patient is unable to tolerate non-invasive or the non-invasive ventilator failed, if the patient has respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest, then we have to go for mechanical ventilation, or if the level of consciousness is deteriorated or the patient is agitated, if the patient has massive aspiration or persistent vomiting, or is unable to remove the respiratory secretions, or if there is hemodynamic instability or tachyarrhythmias or life-threatening hypoxemia, then we have to go for sedation and mechanical ventilation. The exacerbations, they have negative impact on the quality of life of the patient. They have negative impact on the symptoms and deterioration in lung function. The cost is very high, especially if they require ICU admission. Mortality is increased and there is accelerated decline in lung function. The 30-day mortality from severe COPD exacerbation is about 26%, while that from myocardial infarction, 7.8%. All acute exacerbations of COPD requiring admission, the mortality at 30 days is 4.6%, at one year, 24%, at three years, about 48%. So patients with COPD who are exacerbation prone, this is worse than any other cancer. In any patient who have COPD, we have to look for other comorbidities. Usually these patients are middle-aged or elderly, and they are smokers, so there is risk of cardiovascular disease. We have to look whether they have heart failure, ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, peripheral vascular disease, or hypertension. Osteoporosis is more prevalent in patients with COPD than the general population. So every patient with COPD, we should check the uh, bone densitometry. They are more liable or likely to get anxiety and depression. Also, COPD and lung cancer, we have to screen them for lung cancer. They are more likely to have the metabolic syndrome, especially if they are obese or overweight. Gastroesophageal reflux is more prevalent. Bronchiectasis is, is more common, and we have to see whether they have symptoms suggestive of obstructive sleep, apnea, or. The prognostic factors in COPD depend on multiple variables. Body mass index, those whose body mass index less than 21 they are, this is a poor prognostic factor, and depend on the degree of airflow limitation, whether they have exacerbations or not, or whether they have respiratory failure. And one of the indices which indicate the prognosis is the BOT index. And also the presence of comorbidities also might affect the prognosis in patients. This slide showed the effect of respiratory failure on mortality. Those on red 
line, those who have non-hypercapnic type 1 respiratory failure, so the survival after five or six years is about 33%. Those who have type 2 respiratory failure, but reversible, those who have CO2 retention during exacerbation, but after that, they have hypoxemic respiratory failure. The mortality after five years is about 20, the survival is about 26%. While those who have permanent type 2 respiratory failure, which means hypoxemia plus hypercapnia, only 11% they are alive after about five years. This slide showed the both index. B stand for body mass index. Those who have body mass index less than 21, they got one point. If more than 21, zero. The O stand for airway obstruction. How much the FEV1 has percent of predicted. If the FEV1 more than 65 percent predicted, zero. 50 to 64, one less than 35. Three. The D is the dyspnea, according to the Medical Research Council dyspnea scale, zero to one, they have zero point. If they have four, then this is three points. And the E is the exercise tolerance, how much they can walk. And we check the six minute walking test. If they can walk more than 350 meters in six minutes, this is zero. If less than 149 meters in six minutes, good three points. Here you can see the four year survival. If they have zero to two points on both index, 80% will be alive. They have three to four points, 67% will be alive. If five to six, 57% alive. Between seven and 10, only 18% will be alive after. For you. This is the last slide. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, this is my email. You can send me an email and I will be glad to answer you. Thank you very much.